But today's speaker is uh, Scott Sewell, who I think everyone knows quite well. Uh, and Scott received his undergraduate degree in physics from Colorado College and then PhD at University of Colorado in 1995. And he did his research on laser measurements of trace gases in the atmosphere. And then he spent 10 years at MIT uh, teaching undergraduate experimental physics. And since then, he has been back at NCAR uh, since 2008. And his main uh, work interests are in project management related to observatory and instrumentation design and construction, uh, specifically optical sensing technologies, laboratory automation techniques, and undergraduate education. So please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so this is going to be a bit different than most of the HAO colloquia. Um, I uh, was invited by Nick to talk a bit about what's new in the IG. And so honestly, my target audience is not people like Steve and Roberto and Alfred. It's people like Gong and Caitlin, our newest colleague, people who are peripherally aware of this group of nerds up on the third floor and not sure in what we're doing. So I hope that the, by the end of this uh, talk, you guys all have an appreciation for kind of what the IG is doing. And um, so I'm dividing into three uh, topics today, people, processes, and projects. Um, and so I'll sort of jump into it, but it's roughly speaking, um, <laughs> there's a, I promise you there's only 30 slides, there's not a single equation in this entire talk, actually there's one equation, you know, there'll be a test for everyone to see if they can see that, I thought uh, it might have elicited some response. Um, Scientific method, right? We all know, depending on where you start in that iterative process, it either starts with a, with a question, a hypothesis, resulting in maybe some testable observables, or perhaps it just starts with the, the photosensor, the eye, the skin of your um, body, making a measurement, leading, leading to a question. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, high resolution tape measure. But, but, but honestly, you know, m many of the people in this building spend their lives thinking about questions related to this picture. And the IG is really about that tape measure in some fundamental, basic, reductionist sense. <laughs> um, engineering's in our DNA. If you can ignore the picture of the Climax mine up there, and you can't even read the abstracts, so I will read it for you, photoelectric devices keep telescopes free from seeing errors in both hour angle and declination. Threshold control is incorporated to aid guiding during cloudy periods. Most changes in atmospheric transmission do not introduce false error signals. That could be 19 or 2017, right? This is relevant as it is today as it was back when it was written by a couple of HAO folks, Fred Fowler and Don Johnson. I don't know if anyone remembers them or if they were around. This is Don Johnson. Went on to be a detective in Miami. Let me talk briefly about people. You know, it's, it's, it's a cliche, but people really are the, the heart of any sort of group. And I want to briefly introduce you to the five people who currently comprise the group. Two of them you know very, very well, um, Alice and Greg. So let me start with them. Greg Card, who's currently, as we speak, lifting the hilltop spar off of the, um, um, its mount at Sacramento Peak, um, is in the upper left-hand corner. Greg um, brings the, a NASA-imbued discipline for reliability, quality, and um, assurance. He has many skills, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, very good at the observatory level kind of thinking. You know, what types of infrastructure is needed from cleaning systems to uh, power systems, things like that. He really has his finger in just about every project that's um, underway at HAO. Alice Lisinski, who gave me the one candid photograph, which I appreciate, Alice, thank you very much, is our resident ski bum, as well as I want to describe a bit about Alice. She's a software engineer, right? But, but much more than that, there's a lot of um, software folks in this room. Alice's specialty, if, if I'm allowed to say this, is in, I want to call it a dance, right? You're controlling an instrument which has multiple axes, synchronization requirements, um, latency issues where you're wondering, is my signal going to get to that device in time to trigger this device? So she's incredible at, again, highly optimized code and sort of a, an instrumentation-based engineering approach, which is pretty different from the types of code development that a lot of the folks in this building deal, deal with. She also was responsible for the, uh, the Sunrise Gondola Pointing System, which was a tremendously complex um, set of algorithms, um, uh, uh, control systems, and uh, programming all within a PC-104 factor. So she pointed a 6,000-pound gondola on a computer about that big. So it's pretty remarkable. Rob Graves, is Rob in the room by chance? 
He's probably working. Most of the pictures you're going to see in this presentation are built by Rob. You know, Rob is an artist, right? He, he's the guy who thinks about what is the bend radius in order to have me make this cable look really, really nice. What types of materials do I need to use so this thing doesn't outgas? Um, just an incredible technician with that, that level of de attention to detail. And then finally, my colleague Phil Oakley, um, uh, he's an astrophysicist. Uh, rocket engineer, comes with a wealth of experience, and um, sort of serves now as HEF's lead systems engineer. And the role is really critical. He's the guy who helps us translate science into engineering. He's the one who helps the scientists understand, well, you want to make these types of um, science use cases. Here's the types of things we can do to um, develop those cases. And we'll talk a bit more about the systems engineering role later on. And, um, we, uh, we, go, we wax and wane. The group uh, goes anywhere from five individuals right now to maybe eight and um, under, other times, depending on our project load. Right now, we're sort of at a minimum level, if I may say so. And then the future, right? Um, any organization has to think about succession planning. And we all know about pipeline issues related to science and engineering. HA, I'm really proud to say, has a, has a long-standing commitment to undergraduate education. This summer, we're going to be hosting eight engineers. Um, undergraduate students from the University of Colorado School of Mines in Jackson State. They're sort of just shown here, just in case you guys see them in the hallways um, over the next three or four months to get a feel. I think that's so Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> 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 he's, he's already on my list for not providing me with a photograph, so we'll see what Daniel's like. But And you can see below them sort of the, the project list. So just very brief, I'll talk about projects at the end. But Diego and Fernando are working on uh, on a DIMS, which is a distributed irradiance satellite, as well as a community SPAR project. Alyssa and Keon are going to be helping Steve Tomchek with um, some uh, uh, photographic experiments related to the eclipse. Anahid and Daniel are going to be working with Alfred and Roberto um, down in the uh, first floor assembly lab, trying to uh, work on the integration of the BISP instrument. And then Kai is going to be our lead on modeling the SPAR that Greg is bringing back this week in, in support of a white paper, which I'll talk about. And finally, Long V is going to be working with Albert on the Chromag um, instrument, helping carry that from prototype to deployment. So it's going to be a great, exciting summer, and and uh, maybe some of these students will uh, come back. Otherwise, maybe we'll wish them well. So where does the IG work? Um, just a, a quick group of pictures. The first floor assembly lab is on the left. That's where the VISP apparatus is being put together. And you can see a little Carol spar there in the foreground. And those of you who have really supreme eyes, there's a machine shop in the back. Um, this is really, um, there's a thermal vacuum chamber on the left. It's sort of a heavy infrastructure, if you will, type of place. Um, this is where we're going to be assembling and verifying the VISP um, instrument this summer. Upper right-hand corner is the Mauna Loa Solar Observatory, which you guys are all very familiar with. We don't do so much work there as we support our colleagues out in Mauna Loa, um, but we do do a lot of design and work with our colleagues and sort of deploy instruments out there. The bottom right is the third floor instrumentation lab. You guys, I, I would always encourage, by the way, everyone to, when you're walking through the building, to walk in there once in a while and say hi. Um, it's completely filled up with stuff right now, so it's a bit awkward. But we've, at any given time, have half a dozen projects going on in here. This is where UCOMP is being developed. This is where the high wind refurbishment is, is happening. This is where um, a lot of charge controller stuff for high wind and chromag Leo filter development is happening. And finally, sort of for completeness from the facility's perspective, is the vacuum tunnel facility in the lower left. Um, not a lot of current work is being done in there right now, but this is up at the Mesa Lab, and it is a tremendous facility that Greg in particular is working hard to maintain and refurbish with the support of UCAR. And um, we have some proposals in um, process to use that facility in the future. Okay. So that sort of is an idea of who we are, where we live, where we work. Now I want to spend sort of the middle part of the talk talking a bit about um, processes. And this, this could be you know, the eyes rolling in the back of your head portion of the talk for those of you who don't care about process. It could be very pedantic, but it's really the way by which we operate and ensure that we understand what the scientists want and need and that they understand what we can provide and on what schedule and for what cost. So I'm going to talk a little bit about process now. And I'm going to start by giving you this idealized, honestly, very idealized description of how we would work in an ideal world if we had plenty of time and resources. So we begin, and you might imagine, we articulate a compelling scientific question, right? That's oftentimes comes out of things like these colloquia where a scientist says, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could measure this because that would really help constrain this model? Or, boy, there's some really blue sky research out there because no one's ever made the measurement of that kind of thing. 
Um, one more sort of scientist-related activity is we, um, we, we distill the fundamental question to a series of use cases. And these are oftentimes in the case of the cosmolarge chronograph generated by a community. Um, scientists all over the country, all over the world will suggest different ways for addressing the fundamental problems of coronal physics. And some observables. What types of things can an observatory or an instrument be put into place to measure that would effectively answer those questions? At this point now, and there, and there was definitely some systems engineering roles in there with the scientists up to this point, but now it really does become very much an engineering type of discipline where we take, um, we're trying to define now observables and specifically top level instrument requirements. You know, what does the instrument have to do? And I'll talk more about these things in, in detail later on, so I'm kind of glossing over them right now, initially. We create straw man or conceptual designs. These are, these are brainstorming efforts where we really say, how, one, how might one attack this observable? Does it have to be a telescope? Maybe it's going to be a CubeSat. Maybe it's going to be a, a ground-based something. Maybe it's an airborne type system. And it's, really, it's designed just to generate ideas and to have people poke holes in those kinds of ideas. Um, trade studies and analyses. And I'll show you some examples of these that we've done in the past. Um, but fundamentally, I wanted to point out, this is also the time where you want to start thinking about major risks. And again, I'll have a whole, whole slide later on, on risk analysis and identification. Um, and then uh, sort of a, a, a construct you use in project management, something called a work breakdown structure. If I were to tell you we can build that observatory for $30 million, you're not going to believe me. Or at least you're going to ask, you know, where does those, those numbers come from? A work breakdown structure, as I'll demonstrate later on, is a way by which you break down a project into um, distinguishable elements that are recognizable and costable. So it gets you a little much more control over um, a costing effort. Um, at this point, we might create costing and schedule baselines. We show those to management, and they say, thumbs up, yeah, that's about right. What We think that uh, might support this kind of level of, or no, we need to put some boundary conditions on this design. You need to do this for half the cost or twice as fast, things like that. And then we step into this iteration environment, right? And then we go back and repeat the above steps at progressively graders of detail until, for example, you might spend the first several weeks just identifying the top eight you know, fundamental elements, you know, telescope control system, telescope objective lens, dome environment, and you break all those down into successively lower and lower levels of uh, detail. Design reviews. How do, you, how do you ensure that you're building what people think you want to build? You get externally attended design reviews. These are uh, places where, by which someone stands up and presents either an individual design for a single mechanism or, or perhaps a global review of an entire observatory. The key there is the critical external participation. People who are subject matter experts but have no, have no dog in, in the fight. So they're really willing to, to uh, point out weaknesses, errors, things you haven't thought about. Um, after a PDR, you go back and again and iterate on three and four again. Again, more analysis, more accuracy, more analytical depth. Oftentimes, the stuff that comes out um, in five is it was a result of challenging questions you received during the PDR. Okay, uh, again, so then you come to a critical design review, um, and at that point you uh, initiate fabrication. Um, colloquially, we say you heard the word cutting metal. Um, that's sort of a common way of describing it. Um, there's a lot of milestones and gatekeeper posts you have to get through before you start doing that. And that's really important because things get very, very expensive after you have these design reviews to change. So you don't want to start cutting things until uh, everyone's on, a, on, on board what you're doing. Assemble, integrate, verify. Um, I'm not going to show it today, but there's oftentimes you, you want to be able to verify and validate things at the component level. Is a certain chip going to work as designed? At a subsystem level, is that optomechanical stage going to move as designed? And at a scientific level, are we acquiring the data that are required by the scientist to address his or her question? Um, lots of logistics in field operations, packing and shipping, going to the field, um, and of course then you rebuild things and retest things in the field. Um, supporting field operations, this is sort of an important part of us. We support our observers, as I spoke about. When, when Ben and, and Lisa and Alan are having questions or something has broken, we might have a, like a small red team group here where we'll, we'll address the issue over a telecon and we'll try to figure out an immediate solution and a long-term solution for them. Ballooning campaigns are something that HO is very familiar with. I think Greg and Alice are the only ones who've actually supported them, but these things last for weeks in the field and they require, you know, I'm not sure, Alice, how long you were awake during <laughs> Karuna, but long hours, and you, you know, 
it's, um, it's part of the game. And finally, um, external partnerships, like with the, uh, the Slovak Academy of Sciences and the DKIST program. We have various instrumental partnerships with those groups as well, and we're continuing to work with those colleagues. Um, something that oftentimes gets overlooked, um, decommissioning, storage, lessons learned. These are the things that get missed out on when you run out of resources, but they're really, really important. Otherwise, things just sort of um, have a slow death as opposed to maybe a, a prescribed end date. Um, lessons learned, that's how we do better next time. You know, what did we do wrong as a team? What did we do wrong in our requirements generation? What, you know, what, what, what could we do better next time? All right. So that's, in general, how we work. Um, if you ever want to build a really large project, then you turn to a, a, a NASA a diagram called the Project Lifetime Flow Chart. For those of you who are curious, this is an, a 10-foot chart in the, instrument, in the in, uh, intern offices upstairs. It's just, as you can imagine, all of the gory, gory detail and minutia, I shouldn't say minutia, the important steps that are required from concept through a lifetime. And I have three examples, you know, the CMS detector in Geneva, one of the two LIGO interferometers, and then the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, you know, those types of things couldn't be done without this level of sort of systems engineering, project management approach. Okay. So now, in a little bit more detail, some of the sort of uh, the breakdown. So here's an example of what uh, Steve uh, produced for the Cosmo Large Coronagraph with his the, the community group of scientists on that group. Every one of these rows, and I apologize, you can't read this, is a is a science use case. Um, I will read this one to you since you can't. So the science topic is the role of waves in coronal heating. The data products are Doppler maps, uh, B field maps, uh, electron density maps. Um, those are products. The observables required to make those maps are uh, Stokes profiles for iron 13 and, um, and ratios of these types of lines. We need one arc second per pixel resolution in order to do the, meet the spatial requirements of the science. Images need to be captured every 30 seconds for dynamics. And you would like to be able to do this for at least an hour, more if possible. So again, the science use case that generated this row was actually a, you know, several paragraphs long, came in for a scientist, but it gets distilled down by someone like Phil and Steve together to produce this very easily digestible type of, um, of map. And at the end of the day, you want to show a traceability matrix that your instrument or observatory meets these use cases. Or if someone like Scott McIntosh tells us we can't afford it, you want to be able to say, well, we're going to do A, B, C, and D, and not E and F. So you know, these things need to be prioritized at some level. So, um, so now, now that there's some fundamental understanding within the IG about the science that we were trying to accomplish, how, how do we begin? So I mentioned before that that's the straw man design approach, right? It's a really brainstorming on the whiteboard, maybe with napkins sometimes even, right? Um, I even said it as a napkin. Um, how, big a, how big a telescope? How big an aperture? That's a fundamental question because it drives scale, and we'll talk about that in a little bit a second. Um, Trade studies, should this be a reflector or a refractor? And I'm, and I'm, of course, limiting my discussion to a, a you know, isolated set of cases here. It could be you know, something else. What are the technology requirements required to enable these ideas? Are they novel and underdeveloped? You know, new focal planes which don't exist. Um, are they lab proven but requiring adaptation? This is an example, I'll talk later, this is our CubeSat prototype, which uses you know, off the shelf stuff. Right? It's been integrated into something which might fly in space, but they haven't flown in space, so maybe they're going to fall apart when they get there. Um, so, um, Existing and robust heritage. Right? Um, is this something that has, has a certain technical readiness level, or we've, we've seen it deployed to terrestrial telescopes? Um, is, it, you know, is it like rock solid? All of those things will help us generate this straw man idea and fundamentally coming up with our risks. What are the fundamental supporting facility requirements for this instrument. Um, you know, how, how big is the dome going to be? How many moving parts? This is, the, uh, this is all I'm going to put this in the context of a straw man design. We're not talking about how to build these parts or what they're going to look like. It's really just getting our minds around the scope and nature of this instrument. How fast does it need to operate? Are, the, are we talking about you know, nanoseconds or are we talking about milliseconds? Um, pointing requirements. Um, you know, things get very, very expensive very quickly when you go above, below a certain threshold of um, pointing stability and requirements. Um, special environmental controls, and this one I'm bringing up because we're all, you know, aware of coronagraphs in this room. Um, 
substantial dust contamination. Ultimately, most chronographs are dust limited, and so you might not think it's a very sexy thing to think about, but um, contamination control is really important. Um, how, do you, how do you keep these observatories, which are terrestrially open to the air, clean? Um, dangerous irradiance levels, right? The 1.5 meter lens focusing a solar constant onto a 70 millimeter disc is going to generate, you know, a couple of kilowatts of power which needs to be dissipated. You need to have safety shutters involved. You know, none of this is related to the science. This is all related to operational safety and, and um, but it nevertheless has to be thought about ideally at the straw man design level before you get too far down the road. Okay? What other types of things do we do? We create analytical tools. Um, these analytical tools uh, help convince the scientists and ourselves that what we're doing will work. So this is an example of a, of a, of a flux budget, I think, that um, Phil put together for the large chronograph. You know, it, it's a very nice, um, organized, uh, anyone can use it. You put in certain spectral lines, certain anticipated um, irradiance levels, and you come up with signals and noise calculations. It's, you know, it's oftentimes as simple as that. And um, you give that to a scientist, and they say, wow, that's, I'm not going to be able to measure 10 Gauss fields in that time frame. I need to increase my aperture, or maybe I can you know, change my duty cycle. Or maybe I need to investigate a new focal plane technology with lower read noise. There's many ways to solve those problems. But these are the fundamental tools that our engineering group kind of puts together to enable those conversations. Um, another thing that we like to do is create intuitive communication devices. Um, Everyone in this room has probably read technical documents um, in their own field, and you're thinking to yourself, what, what does this mean? How do I distill this into uh, a, a summary that I can communicate with? Um, Phil's done, this is an example. He's done a remarkable job showing on the x-axis his wavelength. The y-axis is sort of a dual axis. The upper curve is temperature, log scale, and the lower one is a filter graph throughput of the chronograph. So those of you who are familiar with Tufty, the sort of the visual design fellow who has these remarkably um, clever ways to display information, this is, this is sort of, I think, a really useful scientific product. It allows, at a glance, I probably need to stare at it for a while, to um, understand what coverage you're going to be able to do with this large chronograph, what types of throughputs, where the, where the gaps are in your throughput, where maybe you don't want to make observations. And um, yeah, so. This is an example of something that happens very, very early on in an instrumentation project. This is technical note number one out of the Cosmo project. So I don't, when was this, Steve? I'm not sure. 20, well, it's up to 2015, but it probably began 10 years ago, right? Revision five. Revision five. But fundamentally, this is the kind of stuff you need to do. I, my note there, how large does this telescope need to be? Very quickly, you'll find that uh, a half a meter telescope is a million dollars, and a one meter telescope is $5 million, and a 1.5 meter telescope is $15 million. So these things are very, very fundamental to where you go with these types of paths. And so early on in a project, you do some calculations, some analysis, which determines, well, the aperture needs to be this big in order to resolve these magnetic fields in this time period. Um, here's an, another example of a tracer done by a former colleague, Pete Nelson. You guys probably all know Pete. And the take-home message was in the bottom line there. We conclude that refractors have a significant advantage over reflectors for the dominant sources of scattered light. Again, it's a one-sentence thing here, but it required many years of work, I believe, on Pete's part. He did lots of analysis looking at FEAs, deformation, scattered light. Um, inclusions, just the, the, all the things that might affect that type of choice between a fundamental trade decision between a reflector and a refractor. Okay, and then at about this time, if not earlier, it began thinking about risks. Right, um, what are the highest risks in a project? Okay, and. Um, this is, where, this is where brainstorming is really important because the technical people think about technical things. The, the management people think about management issues. Um, so I'm going to throw out some things here which you may or may not have thought about. Some of the obvious ones, what are the required technology developments? Optomechanical tolerances. If we go to our shop here at NCAR and we ask them to create a, a disc which is you know, centered to within uh, two thousandths of an inch, They'll, they'll, they'll tell us that's $5,000. But if an optical engineer mistakenly said we need that accurate to two microns, they're going to say, well, that's a, that's a $100,000 part, or that's unattainable. So it's really, really important in, in our design work to think about tolerances and how they reflect project risk. Software complexity. Alice can appreciate this one. Is this something that she's done before? Is this something for which you know, we know we have some historical heritage? Or is this brand new 
types of uh, stuff that might be something that's going to um, bite us later on. External risks. This is something that most of us in this building are becoming more and more aware of with Cosmo and Hawaii and in general. Permission to build on particular sites. It's not a foregone conclusion. Environmental assessment, impact st statements. These things have to be done. And they might say, well, there's a, a endangered flora or fauna there and you can't build there. Um, staffing turnover. This is one thing that most people don't think about. Um, but I do, since we have, we have five engineers and if we lose one more, <laughs> we're you know, going to be critical mass. What happens when key project team members leave? And this happens. This is part of life, right? People move on and they change positions. Um, so things I think about. Um, we prioritize, here's, by the way, here's the, the one equation. We um, update these risks. We have these giant brainstorming sessions. We come up with all the risks. But fundamentally, it comes down to a product, a multiplication between a probability of a certain risk happening and its impact. Okay? I call it here benign to catastrophic. But you can, you can monetize those, or you can, you can quantify those types of things. And they can be, it's really important to realize it's not just about performance, not just about telling a scientist, well, your, your image quality is going to be reduced if this thing happens. It could be um, performance, I'm sorry, cost risk. This is a factor of two more money than we anticipated four years ago. Could be a schedule risk. Well, we're not going to be able to launch by this certain date, and therefore it's not going to be able to have this synergistic relationship with this other experiment. Um, Risk registers. Again, we, we formally maintain these only for the biggest of projects like the VISP. But these things are dynamic records. We try to revisit them every couple of months. We say, how have things changed? I know with um, some of the, uh, the VISP optics, they were huge risks initially because we didn't know if anyone in the country could build them. The moment we signed a contract, it got lowered down one level from a five to a four. And then when they actually delivered with a metrology report saying that they met performance, that risk you know, went down to a one, for example. So um, these things are either dynamic, you're always reviewing them, you're always looking at them. And um, it's, that's really important to get many, many people involved in that kind of process. That's just a colorful chart showing you impact and probability of a risk. You want to avoid the red. And again, that's, we spend a lot of time thinking about what risks are in the red and how do we push them out of the red. And I'm not going to mention more than this one picture here, but I want you guys should all know about something called the triple constraint of project management, um, sometimes called a three-legged stool. Scope, <laughs> cost, and time are the vertices of this triangle, and the center is quality. And it's it's you know it's 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 cliche, but it's also true. Um, these things are at odds with each other. So if the scope of a project increases. Roberto says, I want this to do this in addition to what you had previously planned. And the quality is going to stay the same. Time and cost similarly have to grow, or it's not going to work. And so you, you, can, you can look at that from any vertice you want. But that's, that's a fundamental nature of our business. Um, we can right shift schedules sometime in order to give us more time to think through a challenging problem. And that's, that's a way to, uh, to maintain the quality. All right. Um, this is what a typical risk register entry might look like. This is from the VISP project. And um, let me just throw out the middle one there, optics. Um, the, the description of this risk, and these are all assigned to work breakdown structure elements. The gratings may not perform as expected. The grading performance is difficult to predict, right? And um, that's the drives a performance driver. The consequence is simply that VISP optical polariza and polarization performance may suffer. It could result in poor efficiency, which affects science performance. We've ranked a probability of a three and an impact of a three. And by the way, this was done some time ago. It needs to be updated. And then we have some mitigation strategies. What are we doing about this? <laughs> and you know, this is it's definitely near and dear to Roberto's heart. So these are, these are probably Roberto's notes, right? Yep. So he's, doing, he's developing grading characterization testing early in the project. And he's exploring grading polarization mitigation techniques, technical solutions to this problem. And these are long-term efforts. So you start these things early, and you slowly whittle away at them. All right. Um, how do we account for risks, right? So this goes back to the Scott McIntosh question. When we come up with a, a, a number or a schedule date, the next question he's going to ask is, uh, what types of contingency do you have you thought about? What are, what's, what, what's your tolerance for these estimates of time and scope? Um, I just wanted to point out that these things are done at planning baselines all the way from the conceptual design phase through PDR and CDR and construction. They're regularly revisited. And people um, like Joanne, is Joanne on the room with hands? Okay. She would be looking at these types of things for project health. You know, if we are 25% over budget, 
and you know we're one month into the project, that's a problem. That's standard. <laughs> so, and maybe, maybe, but maybe if we're twenty five percent of our budget and we're ninety percent of the way through the project, maybe there's some you know more wiggle room. So it's a important to think about. Um, requirements again. This, this is this is where those of you who are not lawyers um, might uh, start rolling eyes at me. Um, I really learned about this myself through the whole this process. Um, we have spent enormous amounts of time thinking about language and um, careful use of specific terms. I'm just going to put the first three, three words: shall, will, and should. Okay, um, they seem <laughs> indistinguishable, right? <laughs> well, th they're not so much indistinguishable. Um, Requirements are things for which you, as, a, as an engineer, are contractually obligated to deliver upon. You know, if, if something shall do something, someone ultimately is going to have a checkbox saying, Alice, Phil, Greg, Scott, did you guys do that? And if you can't check the box, you didn't meet a requirement. Should, which is almost the same as shall, is a, is a goal, right? Boy, you know, this is like where Steve might say, I really want the instrument to do this. Um, here's my requirement. But if it could do this, that would be great. And so those are, you know, types of shoulds. Um, oftentimes you can read you know, statements of work and you're looking for shall statements because it really is a very quick way of saying what do I have to do to uh, make this thing work. So how do you write good requirements and uh, why should you care, right? That's why I'm going to get to that to the bottom line. Um, this kind of goes to when you hear someone uh, on the news talk about um, the effects of climate change and they say sea levels will rise two inches. You know, sort of and, that, and the statement stops there, right? It's a very frustrating thing for we scientists and engineers because it doesn't give you any idea for, for bounds, for tolerances. So any good requirement has to have um, tolerances. You know, the telescope has to move this fast or greater than this speed or something like that. Um, this is really important. Requirements have to be free of implementation. So if Alfred says his uh, Cro-Mag experiment needs to do something, that's fine. He can't say, and it has to be done this way. I mean, he can say that, but that doesn't, doesn't result in what's a good requirement. <laughs> Just a good way. Um, exactly. <laughs> we want to keep all requirements implementation free, because people oftentimes have better ideas than we have ourselves about how to do something. So why constrain yourself by saying, I have to use a, an Apple computer to do this? Why couldn't I use a PC or something? That's a, that's a trivial example, but you get the idea. Um, requirements should be accompanied by rationale. You know, why? It was always a nice one to, to know. Um, oftentimes, these things get buried in someone else's requirements. Um, Greg has an interesting thing right now. We're designing a, uh, a subsystem for the Highland Gondola. And he told me, Scott, we need to get certifications for all of the aluminum stock we're using to build this, this gondola with. And I said, Certifica a certification for a piece of aluminum is like a, a metrology report from the, uh, the factory saying it meets certain stress-strain relationships or it was tempered at some you know, rate. So it's a very fundamental materials process. Well, it turns out that NASA requires these types of things to ensure that when this 6,000-pound gondola gets lifted, it's not going to fall apart. Um, so it's, it's remarkable where requirements come from. It's just nice to know where they come from and things like that. Um, Clear and unambiguous, and again, that's, that's, that's just, uh, it's, it means what it says, but you'll, you, <laughs> you know what you mean when, when someone says, um, boy, um, uh, I can't, it's nothing coming to me right now, but um, it's, it's language, and it needs to be something that three or four people all can read and say, yeah, we understand what that means. And if it's, it's also incumbent upon the engineer to say, I don't understand what that means, or the scientist to push back and say, that's, that language is not clear to me. So. Um, traceability is really important, right? There, there might be one, a handful of fundamental science requirements. You know, we shall measure coronal loops at this cadence and at this frequency, um, and that those will generate low, lower level requirements. So fundamentally, every requirement you have to know where it comes from. They, they shouldn't appear out of out of thin air, so to speak. Um, verify. Uh, this is an important one. The verifiable. Let me throw down the, the four or five ways which you can verify a requirement. If you're writing a requirement, either as an engineer or a scientist, um, it better fa fall into one of these four categories. You should be able to test that requirement has been met. You should be able to demonstrate it in a, in a lab situation or a, in, a, in an office. By inspection is a valid measure of uh, validation for some requirements, and then analysis. Um, maybe there's a report that accompanies something showing that this component will achieve what it means. Um, interfaces. Um, and, uh, David's in the room, so he, he can appreciate this one with the, the DKIST HL relationship on, on uh, VISP. Um, 
it's really, really challenging when you have two large groups, you're building something in collaboration, but there's this, 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 this not ba barrier, this interface. And we need to know what DKIST wants, they need to know what we're providing, and getting that written down is really hard because interfaces are oftentimes the last things people think about. You know, um, we know that we need to have a fiducial on the coup de floor of, uh, of DKIST so that Phil knows where to place our first optic. Yet getting that number written down is, is surprisingly difficult. Right? Um, okay, and then my last, my, my politicizing here. Um, conceptually simple. These things, it's really hard to do this stuff well. Um, requires a lot of skill sets, lots of people, lots of iterations. Um, but the take home message is the following. A poorly written requirement will cost money. And detailed design work shall, should, not proceed until all requirements are developed and agreed upon, right? Um, that's one of the things for which we're most guilty about. And I'll blame myself this, is, and I'll, I'll attribute that to our co my science colleagues as well. It's very easy to say, oh, we'll figure that part out. Let's just start, let's start design, let's start building. Um, and we all know that it's, um, you spend a few days designing something and something changes, and that, that will definitely impact how you would have designed in the first place. It's really hard to adhere to. We, we, we don't work serially in our lives, and that's, that's one of the things that's it's, it's almost emphatically important. So what's a work breakdown structure? This, this WBS you hear about a lot, um, and why is it important? Um, well, this is a definition from a NASA document. It's a hierarchical organization of all the hardware, software, services, and other deliverables necessary to complete a project. Okay? And its purpose is to allocate the work into manageable segments to enable the planning, control of cost, schedule, and technical content. Um, these things are so standardized, NASA insists that if you're going to be putting something into space, these are the first two levels of your WBS. You, know, there's, there's, you don't even argue about this. This is, just, this is how you describe a spacecraft. And that could be from a GO satellite to a, a CubeSat. Um, it can be slightly different for terrestrial telescopes, but fundamentally they, they follow these types of things, these types of structures. This is an example of how the, a work breaks down structure was used for the large chronograph during our PDR. We had nine um, descriptive elements describing the functions or the deliverables of the large chronograph. We broke it down into labor, materials, and equipment, represent proportional costs across the project and, and budgets. So this is, you know, it's, it's, again, it allows someone to look at, so one of my biggest fears as the, uh, being involved in this project is the um, facility buildings, okay? Uh, the the take-home number there is 3.25 million. Okay, well, that's, that's just a number, right? And that came from a lot of uh, bottoms-up estimates provided in the past by UCAR facilities experts looking at the cost of building on Hawaii. And so you do all the work you can to come up with an accurate number. But then, as Joan and I know, we built stairs at our facility recently, more than just stairs, <laughs> um, uh, upgrade, and it came back much more expensive than any of us would have appreciated, even with the cost of building on Hawaii. So it's just, you know, these things need to be read with a lot of cons uh, care and caution, but it's, it's, what, it's how they get used. Okay. Um, work breakdown structures also allow uh, me to talk with colleagues like Joanne and saying, Joanne, here's how the money is going to be spent over the lifetime of this project. This is, this is the spending profile for um, the large chronograph. You know, it's, it's not too relevant. You can see various milestones throughout the progress. And, um, you know, sort of a slow start where a lot of design work and relationships are getting built, construction efforts, and then things, as the things go into operations, they sort of, de you know, decay. So, at this point now, all of this scaffolding, I'll call it, is in place. Uh, science use cases, requirements, definitions, straw man designs, work breaks on structures. We kind of know how to attack this product. And now the real work begins, right? This is an example of an optical design flow chart. So this is, you know, Dennis Gallagher, Phil Oakley's kind of world. And um, in red, and again, I apologize, you can't see this, I have a disciplines listed, right? So it, it's not just, you know, uh, spending time in front of a computer and figuring out how to uh, manipulate glass to bend photons into a certain, certain focal plane. There are um, myriad relationships with mechanical and thermal engineers, um, systems engineers, um, shop managers. Um, this kind of thing, again, is one of these naturally iterative processes. And one of our, the biggest dangers and, and problems in our world is, is not thinking about them iteratively and thinking these things happen serially. Thinking that an optical designer spends three months in an office, comes out with a design, hands it to a mechanical engineer, and gets built. 
And this is where a lot of cost overruns occur into the not appreciating this, this dynamic cycle. So um, bringing it all together. So again, I just skipped over like 10 years of our lives, right, Alice? <laughs> but you, you, you come up with these designs, these approaches, implementations, and you have these design reviews. Again, this is just a, a picture from the large chronograph design review. And it occurred in sort of a, a clockwise fashion, starting with the executive summary and glossary terms at the top in the red boxes. We quickly launched into a description of the science requirements, concept of operations, and safety plan for the large chronograph. Um, Phil spent a, a large amount of time talking about system level requirements in those yellow boxes. Um, those system level requirements turn into design and analysis documents you know, at, at a PDR level. And then we, at the end of the PDR, we talk about how we're going to use show compliance and verification of all these systems. So it, it really it, it ties back all the analysis results with the science and operational requirements. Um, and fundamentally, it's sort of surrounding this management plan where we talk about staffing and organization and, and reporting structures and costs and you know things like that. So that, that's sort of um, how that process works. We do design reviews on. A no, any number of levels, not just at a large observatory level. These are just some sample design review slides from um, the K chronograph optical design review, the Mesa Lab spar guiding system review, um, Alice and Phil and Roberto's software design description for the VISP, um, high wind design reviews. You know, again, they, they happen again, as I mentioned before, before, from the smallest subsystem to a large before, depending on sort of the risk and complexity of the object. You don't need to have a design review for everything, but if you're concerned about it and you want to do the best job possible, they're well worth having. Okay. And I'm going to sort of finish up now by briefly just showing you what we're kind of working on now. So that was sort of the process. Now we're going into the project. Um, what is the IG working on? Um, high wind. Right? So this flew out of Karuna a few years ago. And um, Greg is now in the process of redesigning and rebuilding the gondola with, with DFS. Shown on the left is his, 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 um, his final SOLIDWORKS model for the high wind gondola system. It's, uh, DFS is madly constructing this as we speak right now. And um, all for what might turn out to be the result of high wind. This is, that's what it looked like at when, it, when it landed in Karuna. So you know, we're trying to be able to recover the data, recover the payload, but not necessarily the gondola. But nevertheless, it needs to operate safely. Um, we have a June, is Chen in the room? We have a June 1st um, in, uh, uh, visit by NASA um, to decide if we are ready to fly out of uh, Antarctica this winter. I believe that because of the lack of the polar vortex setting up last winter, they had uh, not enough flights. And so there are, I believe, eight um, PIs who want to fly out of Antarctic McMurdo this winter with room for probably three or four. So there, that's, it's, not, it's not for sure now whether or not high wind will fly this year or next year. It will fly, but there's, a, there's sort of a, a race, a race to the finish for testing. That's where we stand now. Um, the VISP. This is sort of a, if you guys were to go downstairs to the first floor, this is um, what you would be seeing. This is the, I'm showing you three people's handiwork here. Um, this is sort of the elegance of Rob's work. I just want to make sure you guys saw this. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's just fun to look at, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just clean. The stuff I put together looks like rat's nest. Um, that is the VISP control system. What you're seeing there is the, the interface between Alice's software and all the mechanisms. Right? Shown, our first mechanism is the, the fold mirror station. So as the spectrograph um, scans a slit across the field of view, you need to compensate for that by changing the path length. And so Phil's stage has just a set of uh, uh, mirrors which, which move linearly to compensate for that. But that's going to be our first test of the integrated VISP. Right? So, so far, our colleague, we've been sort of working a bit apart, if you will. You know, Alice has been working on code, and Phil's been building this, and Greg and Rob and I have been building this, and now we're going to put it all together with those two students, Anahid and Daniel, this summer. And then uh, Dennis's handiwork. Those are those are mirror mounts for the feed input telescope for VISP. And I, I, there's no scale on that, but those things are this big. It gives you a feel for the scale of VISP. So they probably weigh 50 pounds. Those mounts probably weigh 50 pounds a piece. So. Um, SCD. Um, this is a, a sort of a long-standing relationship with the Slovak Academy of Sciences that Steve's um, been a part of and HAO's um, been working with. This is the second of two instruments we built and delivered to their observatory. There's, there's again, Rob putting the final touches on it. Um, 
This is sort of a, a forerunner to Alfred's Cro-Mag experiment in the sense that it's a, you know, measuring any similar lines, if I'm not mistaken, Alfred, but um, um, an early test for that type of instrument. That was delivered about a, a year ago, if I want to be honest about it. This is the, the Cro-Mag project. Shown in the picture is uh, Alfred's experiment, this beautiful instrument wrapped in um, bubble wrap. <laughs> fundamentally. So this is what we call a prototype, right? This, there's AC power up and down that spar, which is not very safe, right? So um, Alfred's uh, mandate for us now is to, first of all, put it into a proper package so that we don't have bubble wrap, um, convert all the AC electronics to DC versions, make it safe, and then he's got some plans for upgrading the optical system to account for, um, for pointing issues, a tip-tilt system. So it's, it's a combination of making it more robust as well as some, some enhancements to the optical system sort of what's going to be happening. This is currently up at the Mesa Laboratory um, SPAR right now. Um, another project we're intimately involved with right now is the UCOMP upgrade. Again, COMP is well known in this building. This is effectively uh, an effort to make COMP uh, wavelength diverse. Right? So to do that, we've had to um, take an achromatic objective lens and put it on an uh, optomechanical stage to allow it to translate so that it can focus certain wavelengths at the occulter. Um, have built a brand new Leo filter that Steve and Dennis put together. That's, that's you know, it's Dennis's craftsmanship there. It's using some novel materials, lithium niobate, which we've never used before for um, biofringent crystal elements at HIO. Um, and then um, sort of, I guess, maybe uh, taking advantage of new technology, the upper right-hand picture, that's, that's called a, a raptor owl SWIR camera. So that camera is sensitive from 400 nanometers to 1.7 microns. Um, so we're no longer going to be using Mercad Telluride cooled by liquid nitrogen. Um, and it's going to be, and these, things, these things are the size, you know, two or three inches in a box. So um, we're taking, these are, you know, kind of military type devices for night vision and things like that, but they have great applications as well for, um, for astronomical research. And uh, in showing you, this is sort of, sort of an interesting handoff. Dennis did the design for the UCOMP upgrade, which got handed off to Phil when Dennis departed. So this is one of those, those ideas about risks incurred by departing colleagues. Um, Phil had to become familiar with a 14-element custom optical uh, assembly in very short order. Um, and so, yeah. And of course, then Steve's final requirement was we fit all this in the existing comp enclosure. <laughs> so the, the le lower left-hand box is existing comp. And so all these new pieces need to be put in there to, uh, to make this work. Um, OK, something we're kind of excited about is, um, is um, working with undergraduates, right? And so we partnered, thanks to uh, Scott's support, with a senior design team out of the Aerospace Engineering Sciences de Department at CU. And this is the group of students here. They're all seniors. They all gra are graduating like Friday. And they built for us a um, 3U CubeSat prototype. This was done over a two-semester course sequence, where the first semester it was um, deriving requirements and doing design work. And then they began cutting metal, if you will, um, in January, and then integrating and verifying. So this, you can see it doesn't quite conform to a 3U. We have a, an attitude uh, measurement system and a couple of OD filters, which protrude beyond the 30-centimeter box. But fundamentally, this is a, a pathfinder towards our, our own initiative to um, start working again in space. And, um, just because I think those of you who were at the industry day talks last week, you saw this, this animation the students provided. This is an example of what you're seeing here in front of you um, getting put together. I want to just comment that the spec right there, the spectrograph is an Avante's commercial off-the-shelf spectrograph. It's a $2,500 box. The students were able to integrate that into everything else for a total of $5,000. So you're seeing the culmination of hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of work um, integrating you know, $30 Raspberry Pis, $12 lithium batteries, um, a, a, a um, 3D printed attitude uh, monitoring system using four diodes. They're, they're claiming you know, pretty, well, we don't know the accuracy yet. Phil and I just received this box this morning at 10 o'clock, so we haven't read the report of is it, is it degree accuracy or arc second accuracy. Um, but this, the idea is this is, this is going to receive a piggyback ride on board Highwind, thanks to Chen's generosity. We're going to demonstrate its ability to survive ascent through the tropopause. We're going to measure spectra um, from 280 nanometers to 1,100 nanometers. We're going to take context images of the sun during those measurements. And um, yeah, and so that's, that's sort of um, going to be learning, I guess, if you will, how, how, we, how we start developing, working with some of these new technologies. OK. 
Okay, how do I how do I advance? Okay, my last slide here. Thanks for your patience. One thing I'm very excited about is um, an infrastructure proposal for a new community spar. What you're seeing here is the sister spar. This is, I think, at Haleakala, this one here. Um, but this is the 12 foot hilltop spar at Sacramento Peak that um, has been deeded from NSO to HAO. Greg is in the process literally of lifting this thing off with a crane of Jeff Bobka as we speak. It's coming back to Boulder this Friday. And we are going to, the idea here is that we want to engender, facilitate a new generation of instrument scientists. And some of the challenges of the university community is finding a place to put their prototype instruments. You know, it's, it's very expensive to develop an observatory on the summit of a pristine mountain um, with a, you know, a, a multi-hundred kilogram payload capacity spar like this. So the idea is we can, HAO can develop this, can, can put it out there and support it. And um, young early career scientists can propose instruments. And um, there's eight sides to the spar, so multiple instruments could be developed at any given time. Um, HAO would develop a common interface so that power is available, um, maybe, maybe camera interfaces are available, and so that people really can focus on their science. And um, so that's, that's what's going to be happening this summer as well, coming up with sort of a white paper to present this idea to Scott and others for um, see if they like it. So with that in mind, it's been about 55 minutes. Let me stop here and talk. Is that the SAC Peak one? Okay. That's the one, okay. Thank you. Wendy. Yeah. And for the engineers to understand. It's really important, especially for the, for the, the theoreticians, right? And the, and the people. How much do you believe when, it, when, it, when an when a observational scientist like Steve or Roberto comes in and here's a, set, here's a data set? The first thing I would be asking them is how accurate is this data? What is your confidence that this data represents what you're telling me it does? So it's real, ostensibly it's more important for the theoreticians to know about instrument capabilities than it is for instrument scientists. And we have a lot of that. Yeah. Absolutely. In general, not a particular project, uh, lessons learned. Do you want to make any comments on what you think of maybe important lessons learned? For me, it's 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 forgetting the interactions. You know. Um, it's, it's, it, I mentioned briefly the ICDs related to you know developing a common language when you're talking with other groups. It's it's also um, it's testing. It's you know we 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 say okay that we're, it's going to take a week to test that right and typically we greatly grossly underestimate the required testing on systems. Um, there's as you know there's usually a push to start making science observations. Um, it, but I also respect the fact that an engineer will test forever if you let them. Right, that's that's our, our nature, and so um, there's a, there's a healthy a healthy tension between those two groups, but it, fundamentally it's it's uh, lessons learned to be better definition of requirements and interfaces, and more appreciation for the desirability for, for testing. Why do the instruments spar in Hawaii rather than um, Mesa Lab here, the the community spar? Did, did you... Yeah, good question. Yeah. It's uh, probably a multi pronged thing. One reason is because this community spa was also thought to be a um, the new home for Cro-Mag and K-Core during with the Cosmo Suite. So the idea in one sense was that this eight-sided spa would replace the existing four-sided spa, still leaving room for community platforms. The other one I think is simply uh, the scientific rationale for seeing the, the quality of the observations are better. You can only do so much for proof of principle here in Boulder. No, you just mount you just you just mount things upside down. You, just, you have to have an aperture which is sufficiently large to have all the instruments. Can't visualize where the instruments go. Literally on the faces of those eight sides. Yeah. Okay. So you yeah. 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 Right. Why did they make it eight-sided? That's a great question. <laughs> I don't. Uh, a lot of people put eight <laughs> instruments on it. <laughs> How many did they ever have on it? Why did you do nine then? <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> That's a deep question. Symmetry is very important to us. You know, we're, you know. Why stop at eight? Right? <laughs>
No, you can make it spherical. <laughs> <laughs> The aperture becomes a king's decimal. There you go. Exactly. Yes. Tom. Well, that's the question I asked Scott. Why don't you fly that in space instead of on a balloon? So um, well, uh, again, uh, that's a good question. Probably as built, it's, it's not ready to fly. They did w exactly one day of. You'd be surprised what they throw out of the sides of rockets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Um, stay tuned on that because, again, uh, Phil's got some good proposals and ideas in mind. You know, he still has a grant to do something with this, so it's it's not sure what the path. You know, we're, right now, if Chen's flight gets delayed, we're actually thinking about looking for some piggyback missions on some other PI balloons out of maybe out of Palestine, simply for proof of concept, and then go writing into a flight model. I was telling a couple of people earlier the cost of these for for three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. You can buy a complete three-U spacecraft bus from Blue Canyon. That includes attitude determination control to 0 0.002 degrees, 10 arc seconds. It includes telemetry. It includes a command and data handling system, i.e., you know, a, a central processor. It includes the reaction reels, reaction reels and, and thrusters required for pointing. It works. And so for less than a half a million dollars, you can build a, a space-borne instrument. It's remarkable. That it's orders of magnitude in one decade. So well, please come on by visit the IG sometime then. <laughs> yeah. So boat in, in general for this community spawn in general, the IG really is looking to solicit interaction with the community. Every scientist in this room hopefully has one idea of a terrestrial based prototype. Maybe it's you know a pathway to space. Maybe it's just a terrestrial instrument that could find a home on this eight sided spar. The I IG would love to work with the scientists, not just on the third floor. Um, so we <laughs> just just throwing that out there, you know, be non-denominational. <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions, thanks, Scott, again. Thanks.